Good day to you. Um, shareholders, thank you very much for listening to what I've got to say. Um, shareholders, I would also say, um, in particular, thank you for your patience, because cutting to the quick, uh, I feel that I have called upon shareholders' patience over the last couple of years. Uh, the truth is, I am obliged to report to you that 2022 was the second consecutive year that I have underperformed Finsbury's benchmark, the FT All Share Index. Our NAV lagged that benchmark, uh, benchmark uh, for uh, for the second year. What is more, I'm also acutely aware of the fact that today's share price, today's share price is usefully below the all-time high uh, of that share price, which was hit as long ago, <clears throat> I'm sorry to say, as long ago as 2019. And I have to say, from my perspective, that performance, that investment performance is not satisfactory. It's not satisfactory to me as a professional investor. It's also not satisfactory to me as a shareholder uh, in, this, uh, in this company. And all that I can sincerely hope is that things turn for the better soon. Now, I, I will still argue that I don't believe that we need to make radical changes. In, in fact, I don't even think that we need to really make any changes at all to the portfolio in order to look forward to a period of Better share price, uh, better share price returns. Uh, and just on that point, let me note in passing that it is now uh, just over two years since we made a new addition to the portfolio. So the last new holding was introduced uh, back in uh, back in 2020. No, instead. What we propose to do is to continue to apply the, uh, uh, the learnings that we derive from these two quotations that you can see, these two quotations from the blessed Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And what we take from these two quotes, to be succinct, is this, that one way to approach the investment challenge is to construct an investment portfolio around wonderful companies and then to wait. And if you wait holding a portfolio of wonderful companies, then you are prone to find over time that wonderful things happen to your wealth. And the reason why I remain so optimistic about the outlook for Finsbury Growth and Income Trust, and I am optimistic, the reason I'm so optimistic is because it is my conviction that Finsbury's portfolio is populated by, listen, it's populated at the very least by a collection of extremely robust companies. But actually, in my opinion, the vast majority of Finsbury's portfolio is made up of truly wonderful companies. Now, I know that that is a matter of opinion. It's, it's my opinion. But I hope that the 
next slide does offer a couple of facts that help corroborate um, that view I have about the caliber of the portfolio. So we all understand that 2022 was a challenging year for the global economy. Nonetheless, by value, well over 90%, well over 90% of the constituents of Finsbury's portfolio increased their dividends in 2022, including double digit dividend increases from some of the biggest and most strategically important holdings that we have in the portfolio. So for instance, Burberry, the London Stock Exchange, um, Mondelez, and actually the biggest holding that we have in the portfolio today, Relex. Relex increased its most recent dividend by 10%. Now, in addition, and in a sense, this is even more important, 85 percent of Finsbury's portfolio by value last year, 85 percent. In other words, there's a big overlap between that and the previous statistic I shared with you. 85 percent of the portfolio by value, in addition, also either conducted a share buyback last year or paid a special dividend on top of growing their ordinary dividends. And the fact is, only strong companies can do both. And that's what I submit to you. Our portfolio is very largely made up of very strong businesses. Now, those of you who've heard me before will know that I, I love telling stories true stories, but I love telling stories about the companies that we're invested in, stories that seem to me to confirm that the companies that we're invested in are actually getting stronger and stronger with each passing year. And here are a couple such stories. First, I'm sure you'll remember this because it only happened last month, uh, December of last year. Firstly, um, as you recall, in December, the London Stock Exchange Group announced a joint venture with Microsoft. And as part of that joint venture, Microsoft has agreed to purchase up to roughly a 4% stake in the equity of the London Stock Exchange Group. Now, the LSE, as I've already implied, is a very important holding in Finsbury, just under 10% of NAV. On the morning that that joint venture was announced, I received an email and I received an email from uh, a Finsbury shareholder and the heading for that email was a single word and that single word was massive. And I have to say we completely agree with our shareholder. To us this joint venture between Microsoft and the London Stock Exchange, it is a massive endorsement of the LSE's business strategy. And it's also a massive endorsement of the caliber of the assets, particularly the data assets that the LSE has been growing. And for sure, for sure, this joint venture makes the LSE a stronger company. Now, 
Perhaps my biggest disappointment in 2022, certainly I have to say one of my biggest personal embarrassments last year, was the 60% fall in the share price of Fevertree. And, you know, to be candid with you, I thought that I was being so clever when I first started accumulating our holding in Fever Tree back in early 2020. Back then, the shares were already down 60% from their peak level. Um, but notwithstanding that, they've carried on, they've carried on falling over the last couple of years. Of course, it's what happens next that really matters. And let me just share with you our thinking. Um, it is true that 2022 turned out to be a challenging, challenging year for Fever Tree. Um, sharp increases in logistics and bottling costs hurt the company and particularly hurt Fever Tree's US business because it was having to ship lots of stock, lots of product to the US market. And no question that has hurt Fever Tree's profitability last year. And it, maybe it's a fair cop, if you like, that the share price fell. Nonetheless, we think it's so important not to lose sight of the underlying business momentum for Fever Tree in this crucially important geography for the company. As you can see on this slide, even in a tough year, the forecasts say, and I guess we'll have the confirmation of this in the next month or so, but the forecasts are still saying that Fever Tree sales in the United States are going to be up 25%. And that means that the history of this company in the United States since 2015 continues to show something like a 30% per annum compound growth in consumption of Fever Tree's products in the United States. The brand is getting stronger in the US and that's significant. And we just hope, we just hope that Jeff Popkin is right. Now, Jeff Popkin is a non-executive director of Fever Tree. And he's a peculiarly appropriate non-executive director for Fever Tree because he's a US citizen. And he's also the US citizen who helped build the tremendous success of the Red Bull brand in the United States. So someone who you would expect would really understand the opportunity that Fever Tree has in that market. And we were encouraged to see that in September of last year, pretty much at the low point for Fever Tree's share price that Jeff Popkin bought for himself $400,000 worth of Fever Tree stock. Now, as I say, he got pretty much the low for the share price. I think the stock is up maybe 25, maybe 25% 25 uh, since then, but I'm sure, just as we are, Jeff Popkin is looking for much more than that as Fever Tree continues to grow in the world's biggest spirits market, which is the United States, and indeed grow in other geographies as well. We do hope so. Now, I have a statement for you of the blindingly obvious. And that statement is all investors need to beware of the malign effects of monetary inflation on their wealth. 
And I can assure you that we pay a lot of attention to the inflation protection that the constituents of Finsbury's portfolio offer. And on that point, I would now like to invite my colleague, Madeline Wright, to spend 10 minutes with you discussing inflation protection and Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. Yes, inflation is indeed making the news these days. And judging by the number of questions we're asked about it, it's a lot of people's top concern. Let's be clear, we're not making predictions or saying that we think there will be lots of inflation to come. We just don't know. But what we do know is that a significant part of the value of companies is their potential to protect against inflation if it happens. It makes sense to us that investors are willing to put a high price on inflation protection, perhaps through the use of index-linked gilts. But to our minds, some companies can offer this, plus the possibility of real growth on top. So today, I want to take a closer look at exactly those kinds of companies and give you some examples of why their unique products, brands and services have proven protective against inflation in the past. And more importantly, why we believe that these inflation busting qualities will continue to protect their businesses far into the future. As a reminder, this is what inflation has done to purchasing power in three key markets over the last 50 years. Between 1972 and 2022, the US has seen a sevenfold rise in prices and the UK a 14-fold rise. And despite unusual periods of deflation, over that 50-year period, even Japan has seen prices triple. As something of a transatlantic example, here's a ticket from the Rolling Stones 1972 US tour, which you can see was priced at a bargain $6.50, and that is including free parking. In 2021, you'd have been looking at $556 to see the same band. That's serious inflation protection for you and a great illustration of why we think uniquely durable, evergreen entertainment content of all kinds is hugely valuable. Dare I suggest, like Manchester United? But inflation is perhaps most evident day to day in our shopping basket. And as many of you know, Finsbury's basket includes Heineken. It's been an important holding in the portfolio for over 10 years. We think it's a great example of how a really resilient brand and the pricing power associated with that can underpin business growth over the long term. Today, I want to focus on Heineken's ability to price in the US. The Heineken brand has a long and storied history here. It was the very first imported beer to enter after Prohibition in 1933. So Heineken had already been established as an exclusive premium beer brand for a whole 22 years by the time the Brass Rail Restaurant in New York City printed this drinks menu in 1955. Down at the bottom, you can see that a bottle of Heineken is priced at 50 cents. Today, the same bottle is on average 18 times more expensive. Compare that to US inflation, which stands at 11 times in the same period. Pleasingly, there are a couple of other Finsbury investments on the menu, Johnny Walker and Remy Martin, both of which have increased their price 21 times, thoroughly outpacing US inflation. By the way, if you combine our holdings in the three owners of these wonderful brands, Heineken, Diageo, and Remy Cointreau, it accounts for over 20% of Finsbury's portfolio. But back to Heineken. Protected by its premium brand, the business has expanded its global volumes both organically and via acquisition. Sadly, Bloomberg data doesn't go back to 1955, 
but from its earliest date of 1989 to 2021, Heineken's revenues have increased ninefold and its operating margins have expanded by well over 50%. And all of this has added up to satisfying, refreshing returns for shareholders over time. If you had held Heineken since 1989, you would have been the happy recipient of a 4,400% total return, which comprehensively beats the MSCI World Index over the same period. It certainly seems like a good example of Warren Buffett's observation about great companies delivering over time. But can it continue into the future? The most recent quarter's numbers seem to suggest so, especially premium beer volume growth of 15% and overall pricing of 13%. Now, I couldn't resist showing you this slide from Linzel Train's very first annual update in 2008. Cadbury's the key point here, and it's relevant because it's owned by Mondelez, one of our biggest holdings. Earlier on, Nick mentioned that Mondelez's dividend is up 10%. That's in part because of the ongoing success of Cadbury. It's the world's number two chocolate brand with a track record of serious inflation busting, as we pointed out back in 2008. And updating this for 2022 shows that this pattern continues to hold true. But the real reason I wanted to blow the dust off this slide is because it shows that seeking the protective and value building qualities of pricing power has always been a central part of the way we have approached the investment challenge. We think about it across all categories of consumer goods, including luxury and premium. Take Burberry, a significant position in Finsbury at over 8% of the portfolio. I got in touch with the company and asked them to dig through their archives for the earliest price of a trench coat they have on record. That was the 1916 Burfrock, pictured here on a soldier and reminding us of the origins of the name trench coat. Today, the Burfron has become the Kensington and has gone from three guineas to £1,790. That easily beats UK inflation, and it's Burberry's unique brand which has allowed it to do so, and which has underpinned the company's success to date. In the 20 years since Burberry listed as a public company, it has expanded around the globe and increased its revenues over five times, and its operating profits almost six times. We see no reason why this success should not continue into the future. But inflation protection isn't just relevant to consumer goods. It's also crucial for another key idea within the Finsbury portfolio, the increasing value of companies which help their customers process and understand the global explosion of data. Take Relex, one of the largest holdings in the portfolio and the owner of one of the world's most unique and valuable collections of scientific, legal and risk data. Here's a stat straight from the company itself. In 1950, the quantum of global medical research was doubling every 50 years. But by 2020, it was doubling every 73 days. That's why scientists really need Relix's collection of journals and why it's not so much the headline price increases of Relix's products, which protects the company against inflation. Actually, it's the migration to selling higher value and higher margin decision tools and analytics to make sense of that tsunami of data. We view this as another form of price protection and it's something relevant not only for Relix, but also other portfolio holdings, such as Experian and the London Stock Exchange. This transformation has materially boosted the quality of Relex's revenues, as the company has transitioned from being a publisher to first and foremost, a provider of analytics. Between 2000 and 2022, Relex's subscription revenue grew from 39% of total sales to 58%. That's a nice increase, but it only tells half the story. In the same time period, revenues from print 
shrank from 64% to just 6%. Against this backdrop, the company's operating margin increased 45%. And this is in no small part because today, over 50% of Relix's total revenues are from much higher value decision tools and analytics. These products are very sticky, often mission critical, and tend to be deeply embedded into customers' workflows. No wonder Relix's renewal rates are on average over 90%. And as the number of products, tools, and analytic capabilities within Relix grows, so do the opportunities to sell more to existing customers, as well as expand into adjacencies and reach totally new customer bases. In our view, it's this, Relix's unparalleled ability to encourage greater and greater use of its data, which is transforming the business, driving up margins, and ultimately protecting Finsbury's shareholders against inflation, as well as allowing them to participate in the really substantial amount of growth this shift will drive over the next decade. Thank you very much, Madeline. And just testing your patience, I've just got one more example about inflation protection. Perhaps as you consider this slide, you will understand why Guinness is such an important brand for Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. Guinness is the second biggest brand owned by our second biggest portfolio holding, which is Diageo. And what you're looking at on this slide is some data that was actually sent to me by another Finsbury shareholder, this time uh, an Irish wealth manager. And what the slide shows is that since 1900, the price of a pint of plain Guinness, in other words, the price of a pint of plain has handsomely, materially done better than the price of gold. Again, illustrating the inflation proofing that extraordinary brands can offer. This is rare. It's also extraordinarily valuable. And I just want to try and bring all of our focus and attention on just how much wealth, how much of your wealth is at stake getting these decisions right. So let me try and do it this way. Let me ask you this. What was the best performing industry sector in the UK stock market between 1900 and 2015. Now, one pound invested in the market in 1900 by 2015 had turned into just over 30,000 pounds. Meanwhile, one pound invested in the best performing sector in 1900, and I know 115 years is a long time, but anyway, one pound invested in the best performing sector had turned into over 240,000 pounds. Some difference. And that best performing sector in the UK stock market was alcoholic beverages. And it's an illustration of how powerful this combination of inflation protection and secular growth can be. And listen, if you think that this could be simply a 20th century phenomenon, just consider this. Since January the 1st, 2000, the capital value of the F all share index is up. It's up a disappointing roughly 30%, only 30%. Over that same period, the 
MSCI World Equity Index in sterling, so the global equity index, is up about two and a half times. However, shares of Diageo are up seven times since the start of the 21st century. Diageo keeps on walking. Now, I have one more slide to share with you, and here it is. Of course, we wish the new monarch well. We believe that the stability represented by the British monarchy has created value for British investors over time. And since Charles's accession, the FT All Share Index is up, I don't know, four or five percent, maybe. Not too bad. However, he's got a long way to go to match his mother. As Bloomberg points out, over the 70 years of her reign, the return on UK equities was something like positive two and a half thousand. Yeah. While at the same time, inflation was up, in inverted commas, only 20 times. To us, that history is deeply reassuring. And we can see no reason, even given the pessimism that currently surrounds the UK economy and the UK stock market, we can see no reason why sound UK companies shouldn't continue to protect savers' capital against inflation, but also create wealth for them on top. I sincerely hope that that is going to be the case in coming years. And as I said right at the outset, I also sincerely hope that the shares of Finsbury Growth and Income Trust are going to participate or even lead (laughs) those gains. Thank you very much for listening to us.